Has this ever happened to you? You open up the refrigerator and then you touch something that feels kind of warm or maybe even kind of hot? Maybe this gasket around the rim of the door and you think, what the heck? I thought refrigerators were supposed to make cold, not heat. Fact is, this appliance actually contains some heaters in addition to its coolers. That apparent self-defeating contradiction is not a Sisyphean exercise in futility devised as a cruel philosophical joke by nihilistic engineers. It's actually just one of several brilliant pieces of engineering that have made these ubiquitous boxes utterly transformative forces in our lives. Life is so different now than it was just a hundred years ago because of these things. And the basic physics phenomenon that makes it cold in here has been known to humanity for thousands of years, and that is evaporative cooling. It takes a lot of energy, heat energy, to transform a liquid into a gas. Heat from the surrounding liquid and solids moves into the molecules as they evaporate into a gas. The liquid and solids the gas leaves behind are now cooler. This is why sweating, or really any means of getting wet, cools down our bodies. The water on our skin undergoes a phase change from liquid to gas, taking heat from our skin with it. Refrigerators work by containing that process in a closed system that continuously recirculates that evaporating liquid, called a refrigerant. It's never released into the air, unlike the steam coming off that sauce. In this closed system, the evaporating liquid stays in the box. Heat energy that's stored in the food you're trying to cool down will evaporate a liquid into a gas. That liquid is coursing through here in a system of pipes, probably in the wall behind you. The refrigerator then compresses that gas and condenses it back down into a liquid again by ditching its heat into the surrounding environment. That's why refrigerators or air conditioners blow out hot air. The heat that I'm feeling on my hand right now is the heat that was formerly in my house, plus the heat of the compressor and the fans and all the other electrically powered gizmos in there. Then the process just repeats itself on an endless loop. This is called the vapor compression cycle, and it was first described as early as 1805 by an American engineer named Oliver Evans, though he never actually built one. It was a century-long process for multiple inventors to turn this idea into a product that we would all eventually buy. One reason why it took mechanical refrigeration so long to catch on was that there was already a pretty good alternative, natural ice. I have a whole video about this linked in the description. People used to harvest blocks of ice from ponds and lakes in the wintertime. You could then store it in insulated ice houses all year long. You could even ship it to parts of the world that didn't have cold winters. In the 19th century, ice from the U.S. region of New England made it all the way to India. The first thing in people's homes that they called refrigerators were what we would call ice boxes. Literally just insulated food pantries into which you would load a big block of natural ice. As you can imagine, that system had its disadvantages, but it definitely would not poison you or explode. Both of those things could happen with mechanical refrigeration. Why? Because something harmless like water would be a terrible refrigerant inside a refrigerator. It takes way too much energy to make water evaporate. Now, buddy, what you want in here is ammonia. Actually, there were a few refrigerants used in early vapor compression cycles, but ammonia was the most efficient, still is. Under normal atmospheric pressure, anhydrous, or water-free ammonia, has a boiling point of minus 28 degrees Fahrenheit, minus 33 C. The temperature inside a refrigerator is more than enough to evaporate anhydrous ammonia, and when it does, it absorbs a huge amount of energy. The problem is that no closed system is ever completely closed. Some of the refrigerant is gonna leak out, and if a lot of ammonia leaks out and you you breathe it in, you die. This still happens to this day in big industrial refrigerators where ammonia remains a popular refrigerant because it's so efficient. It takes less power to run an ammonia refrigerator, and every now and then some poor worker breathes it in and dies. A refrigerator also relies on an electrical compressor like that one to squeeze the refrigerant down to a state of high pressure. And theoretically, any vapor under compression could explode violently. That's not something you ever want to have happen, and it's definitely not something you want to have happen at the World's Columbian Exposition in Chicago in 1893 when you're trying to convince a skeptical public that mechanical refrigeration is effective and safe, but that is exactly what happened. There was a fire in the elaborately disguised smokestack rising above the cold storage building. Chicago firemen climbed up on the tower to put it out, then the building exploded beneath them. Thousands and thousands of 
fairgoers watched as the men now trapped high above them had to decide one by one if they'd rather burn to death or jump. Nobody knows for sure what caused that explosion, but it could have been the pressurized ammonia in the refrigerator, and certainly that's what almost everybody believed at the time. After that explosion, nobody wanted one of these in their kitchen. So what changed? Uh, the people who actually were in the auto industry for the most part started getting interested in creating home refrigerators, and they started experimenting with different refrigerants. This is Dr. Jonathan Reese, historian at Colorado State University Pueblo and author of many books on this topic, including the one we've been looking at, Refrigeration Nation. He describes how profoundly the world was changed by a global network of refrigerated supply lines called the cold chain. And that is a network that enabled, among other things, the sponsor of this video, HelloFresh, whom I'll now briefly thank. HelloFresh is America's number one meal kit. You don't have to go to the grocery store. You don't have to plan your dinners in advance. The cold box just shows up on your doorstep. There's tons of meal plans to choose from, but we're almost exclusively doing the vegetarian one these days, even though we're not vegetarians. I have trouble coming up with ideas for interesting meatless recipes, and the ones from HelloFresh are consistently delicious and creative. They each take like 20, 30 minutes to cook. That's less time than it takes you to go to the store and back. You follow the dead simple instructions, all the ingredients are pre-portioned for you, which reduces food waste to the point that actually offsets the carbon footprint of the packaging and the shipping. This spicy little sweet potato pocket thingamajig is one of the most delicious meatless things I've cooked at home in a while, and I never would have thought about it myself. But HelloFresh is flexible, you can get meaty recipes if you want to, you can add desserts or breads, you can pause your deliveries if you need to, whatever. Use my code 80 Adam Ragusia to get a total of $80 off, including free shipping on your first box with purchase. Go to HelloFresh.com to redeem and for more details. Link and code are in the description and save 80 bucks. Thank you, HelloFresh. Now, how did we all end up with an appliance in our homes that runs on something as dangerous as anhydrous ammonia? Well, as Dr. Reese explains, we didn't. I mean, ammonia was was good and actually remains good for large industrial refrigeration, but you can't make an ammonia home refrigerator. So they started a, a, a experimenting with different refrigerants. This is eventually going to lead to Freon in the 1920s, the real innovation that makes refrigeration safe for everybody. Maybe not the ozone layer, but safe for not having poisonous gas leak out of the refrigerator in your kitchen. Yep, Freon is a brand name for chlorofluorocarbons. CFCs and some similar chemicals are relatively non-toxic to us, but when they inevitably rise to the upper atmosphere, they spark a chain reaction that literally destroys the layer of O3, ozone, that protects us from much of the sun's dangerous ultraviolet radiation, which eventually led to various global bans and the gradual replacement of CFCs with similar chemicals that also have their own environmental hazards, but at least they're not ammonia. The fact that they found something to run these things on other than ammonia means we could all get these things in our house. That and the miniaturization of the machinery involved in running these things. Refrigerators used to be huge. First modern refrigerator is 1927. A lot of the models before that required you to cut a hole in your kitchen and put the machinery in the basement and there would be a belt that would be running and it was just not viable for anybody who wasn't really rich. But when they figured out a way to put the, the, the machinery and the cabinet in the same object, around 27, and then to mass produce that object, home refrigerators took off really quickly. And by World War II, a majority of Americans had home refrigerators. It still took some effort to convince consumers to ditch their old ice boxes, which worked pretty well. But one of the marketing strategies that seemed to work was, hey, buy an electric refrigerator and then you won't have to let Adam's dirty Italian grandpa into your house. Grandpa Ragusia was an ice man who delivered blocks of ice to people's houses in New York. Sort of the, the image of the iceman is somebody with dirty feet who mess up your rug and be a, a huge pain or miss a day and all your food is going to be spoiled. Um, I mean, electric refrigerator manufacturers were arguing that you should get rid of the Iceman, and there's good reason to get rid of the Iceman. 
poor grandpa. Refrigerators also eventually developed another killer feature that allowed them to kill the Iceman, and that was the ability to actually freeze things in here, not just keep them cold. The temperature in an icebox is well above freezing. In the 1940s, electric fridge manufacturers started putting a little compartment in the corner where you could actually freeze water into ice cubes, which is all people use it for at first. The industry also made standalone electric freezers, of course, and then in the 1950s, combination refrigerator freezers, like mine here. In the 50s is about the time when frozen food takes off. Until home freezers over there, you actually had to cook the meals that you ate at home. But now you could buy totally prepared foods at the store, keep them frozen at home, thaw them, and eat them whenever you want. This probably did as much as anything to disrupt the systems of gender and racial supremacy in which people like, well, me, relied upon other kinds of people to spend basically all day in here cooking. But there was still one major design flaw of the home refrigerator freezer, and it brings us back to where we started, to the heaters on the fridge. The big problem with early refrigerators is the frost, right? The air in your kitchen has water in it. The food that you put in here has water in it too. That water is gonna condense on the cold surfaces and turn into frost. Eventually, thick layers of frost that block the transfer of heat from your food into the circulating refrigerant. It used to be that every now and then you would have to defrost the fridge, take everything out, maybe try to eat everything that you had left, and then unplug the thing, open up the doors, and let it all melt. You don't get frost-free refrigerators until 1957. Oh, it's an automatic mechanism that like melts it from the outside. I mean, it's why the, the back of your, it's part of the reason why the back of your refrigerator is hot, even though obviously the container is cold. And that includes a little heater that runs through this gasket or air seal on the door. Keeps this from getting gunked up with the frost. But other than little gizmos like that, this refrigerator is basically the same machine that rolled off the assembly lines about a hundred years ago. Though Dr. Reese says something big is coming. Some different way of keeping stuff cool that doesn't rely on hazardous refrigerants, and that is keeping stuff cool with magnets. But that's a conversation for another day.